Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Daniel, I'm very excited, uh, you know, to to chat with you. We we started talking, and it was so fun that we almost did the whole podcast without pressing record. So I'm gr- glad that we now <laughs> press record. Um, so one of the things I wanted to kick things off with uh, right off the bat is uh, who has been a most favorite or memorable boss uh, in your career? So, so this is interesting. I, I, I'm I, afraid I'm not going to give you one because I've been super lucky and super spoiled and I've had some amazing bosses. And it'd be unfair to name one of them um, at the expense of some others. I, uh, I, I, can, I can name names, but the, um, I think the why is a much more interesting question. So I, one of my very first bosses, um, she was probably only in her mid twenties. I was like fresh out of college. I was probably 22. So we were a very young team and she was, I think in her first software management role. And it was a small business, uh, probably 30, 50 employees. And it was a data marketing firm in the early nineties when that was a, when that was a thing. And I basically, I destroyed the database, right? So, so one day by through, just through being a complete idiot, you know, a, a, an entirely user rookie error, I accidentally shut down the live production database in the middle of a data run in the middle of the working day by accidentally shutting down the wrong um, Sun workstation. And, and it was, I, I, I remember it in real time, you know, like that, that um, uh, extended time thing that protracted time thing distended sorry that's the word distended time so i'm sitting there and i was i typed in shut down minus h now on a server and um and there was a clock ticking on the screen and and the clock should have stopped right because the server and i just went oh no i haven't shut down this server therefore i have shut down another server and as i'm processing this the door bursts open and this lady runs in who's the database administrator going, someone's just shut down the database. <laughs> I was like, hit me. <laughs> and, and I just, honestly, I thought I was going to get fired, right? That's it. That's like, you know, that's your sackable offense. And Jan, my boss, turned around to me and she said, it didn't even skip a beat. She said, today's the day we learned about database restore. <laughs> and it was just this absolute object lesson in blameless response right you messed up there's no point beating you up you know you messed up i know you messed up let's fix the database and we sat there reloading data off of tapes because it was in an era where you still had like exabyte tapes and we reloaded data until about 11 o'clock that night (laughs) she stayed and and the last tape went in and we finished and she said great we're restored see you tomorrow wow that was it there was no in my you know, review, she didn't go, you know, that thing you did a couple of months ago where you just basically shut us down, nothing. That's incredible. And that, that as a, just as a, as an attitude that really stayed with me. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's incredible. Uh, she, uh, must've had a lot of patience, uh, in general and, and be able to, to do something like that. And, here you are many, many years later, still recalling <laughs> that story. So uh, that's incredible. I, you know, I, I've heard, I've heard many leaders um, who've had, ex- or many other people on, on the podcast that have had similar experiences. And, and it says a lot, right? I mean, like you said, there's no point beating you up and it shows that like mistakes are actually okay. Um, which, you know, if mistakes weren't okay, then people would just try less things. And what well, finest things or or the other thing is that when something goes wrong, lie, right? <laughs> Cover it right. up, you know, deny. <laughs> yeah. All of that. And it creates those, those those toxic behaviors. And if you're in a culture where it's, you know, we and 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 of course, immediately off the back of that, I wrote a bunch of scripts and I made a bunch of configs so that if you were logged into a production server, the screen was bright red, right? <laughs> you know, you couldn't like the shutdown command said, you are on a production server, are you sure? You know, stuff like that. So I, I put those stops in myself because I didn't want to be that idiot again. So, so all of the stuff that you would normally have, all of the kind of follow-up you would normally have still happened. But, you know, she didn't need to throw away around or yell at me in order to make it happen. Yeah, no, it's super interesting how that like one way that you react in that one critical moment affects the culture of the company going forward. Well, so in fact, so I, I can riff on this all day. So um, 
I did a talk a few years ago because um, it's a good friend of mine, Trisha G, who's about someone else you should speak to. Um, she's a brilliant, brilliant programmer and now developer relations for JetBrains. And she, she's very structured in her career. You know, I'm, I'm in this role in two years time. I want to be in this role. So I need to learn X, Y, Z, figure this thing out. And I'm like, oh, that looks fun. <laughs> oh, this looks like a nice, Aiden looks like a nice guy. I'm going to go work with him. And so, and so I've just like drifted through my career and she's been very structured. But what I discovered or what I discovered, what I, what I realized is although I've had a very accidental career, I've had very deliberate advice from people. There are very specific interventions with people in my 30 years that I can say that was pivotal to me. And also that he or she in the moment when we had that conversation, they had no idea that was a thing. They had no, Jan had no idea that 30 years from now, I'd be talking about her in a, in a podcast, right? She was just being Jan, yeah? And I think you know, with, with great um, leaders, it's, it's that whole, they're, they're just being themselves and themselves happens to be someone who is fantastic in that role. Yeah, no, that, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Sometimes uh, you only look back on things, you know, like you said, that you look back 30 years ago and you're like, wow, that event uh, or that thing that that person said, and it all of a sudden becomes super relevant to what you're working on now. Mm -hmm. So what, I guess one of the, the things that I, you know, can't help but ask you is you also coach a lot of other people and a lot of leaders, like a lot of the work you do, obviously is in uh, agile coaching and training on agile, but amongst the the mistakes and you know things that you see very often that it's it's almost become trait. Like, what are the things that that you see um, very often in mistakes that leaders make? So this is okay. So before I get to, I want to unpack a couple of terms, um, or at least e explain how I see a couple of terms. So management, a manager. Um, in, in my head, in my world, managers don't manage people. So management is not a like a supervisory, um, uh, superior you know, um, type uh, role. Um, man in, in, in a lean context or an agile context, a manager is someone who manages a system of work that has people in it. Right? Mm. So, so when you talk about management, you're managing the environment, you're managing the context and you're creating an environment in which people can do their best work. You can't make people do things, you can create an environment in which if they choose to, they can do things. So, so that to me is, about, is what management is about. Um, leadership is a very different thing. They're related, but they're, they're, there's, a, there's a very clear distinction. Leadership is about setting direction and is about that alignment piece, okay? So it's the, you know, it's the, um, the uh, getting, uh, inspiring people with, the, with the, uh, the, the wish to be, you know, in the sea and with the wind in their hair and all of that, rather than instructing them how to build a ship. So in that context, I think the, the most common failure modes I encounter, and certainly the things I try and coach against, as it were, is, is exactly the opposite of those two things. So someone who believes their job is to be a combination of a policeman and your dad, <laughs> you know, in the workplace, right? They're a parent and they're a policeman. So they're like, you know, you are gonna do this. I'm gonna give you instruction now. And I'm also gonna check up on you and make sure you did your homework, you know, make sure you tidied your room. Um, and, and shifting that mindset from uh, directing people to creating an environment in which. So, and, and again, most people direct people because that's how they were taught. That's what they think management is. And that's what they think being a manager is. And especially this idea of a line manager, where we, we have this term line manager, and no one really thinks about where the term comes from. And it comes from a production line. It comes from a, a line of people on, in a factory doing the same thing again and again and again and again. And, and even then, actually, as a line manager, your job is to manage the line, the production line, not the people on it. <laughs> so we still get it wrong, even though we use the term line manager. So in terms of leadership, I think you know, people, people will follow you on a compelling journey, right? They'll, they'll want to. So, so the goal of leadership is to create that compulsion, to, to, to articulate that compelling journey and to reiterate it and to get everyone excited. 
and the classic kind of what's in it for me, you know. So what's in it for Aiden as a founder or what's in it for Aiden as a developer or what's in it for Aiden as a product manager? And, and to give you that sense of your own self-actualization, your own purpose, um, the bigger picture, like the, we're all on this journey together. And I see a lot of leaders, senior folks, um, who, when I speak to them one-on-one, -on -one, they can absolutely articulate what they want. You know, you know, right? You know what you want fellow to be, right? You know what you want the fellow app to be. Unless it is in your just ritual daily habits to keep articulating that again and again and again and again the 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 um, decay curve of everyone around you remembering that is much much steeper than you think hmm. <laughs> you need to go on and on and on about it to remind people why this is fun and to remind people why this is exciting and i think one of the leadership fa fails i see more than anything is they forget to articulate how just awesome this mission is and how exciting it is and how much fun it's going to be and they just expect people to do stuff without having that uh, that sense of purpose yeah that that's super interesting i guess yeah you, you sometimes think that maybe you sound like a broken record or that they they would know they don't want me to say that again uh but it, i mean is there ever like so people typically don't make the mistake of just doing it too much right it's kind of hard to it's, I think, um, or put it like this, if, if you're getting the feedback that people really, really deeply understand the mission and you're okay, thanks, that's, that's a great problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know many folks with that problem. <laughs> right, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, it, it's interesting because one of the key roles of a leader is also to do this storytelling. And so it's very, very important um, you know, and I think, you know, coming as a, say, founder of a company, uh, this makes a lot of sense to me, but this isn't like a, a founder and CEO thing only, right? Like this applies to everybody. Well, and this, I'm really glad you said that. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, um, the David Marquette um, turn the ship around hmm. mindset where he talks about uh, leader, leader rather than leader follower. So in other words, and at every level of the organization, anyone in any role is a leader. Right. And then and then he talks about intent based leadership. So rather than asking permission or waiting to be told, and they're the two most common default modes in most certainly Western hierarchical organizations, um, is you say, I intend to. I intend to do X. I intend to uh, push this build into this production environment. I intend to make this change. I intend to go and interview these customers. And, and, you know, everyone starts off doing it in their out loud voice. Eventually it becomes much more an internalized thing. But as, to start with, as you're practicing it, you say it out loud. Hey, folks, I intend to do this. And your stand up should really be what you intend to do today. Right. What's our intent for today? And we can talk a lot about stand ups as well. It's one of my hot topics. Um, but so so and, and then as a manager, because then we've got the leadership and management into, into twingling as a manager, you're then managing by exception. Because all you're listening for is when someone says, I intend to do something that just sounds odd. <laughs> I intend <laughs> to shut to down the now? server, the database server. <laughs> <laughs> I intend to shut everything down. And you can imagine, this is how like at Netflix, how um, uh, Chaos Monkey started, right? I intend right. to just write some code that's going to shut down servers arbitrarily. Wait, stop. You're going to what now? <laughs> and, and that conversation happened. And that conversation was, we know that we don't run our own servers anymore. We're moving to Amazon Cloud. We know that occasionally things are just going to go missing. If we architect for things to go missing and that's okay, we've already won. Hmm. Like we've built resilience. If we don't, then when something happens, we're going to get some unpleasant surprises. So I'd rather we cause the surprises <laughs> than, than they happen to us. And when you explain it like that, I'm going to go and shut down some servers. It suddenly now makes a lot of sense. But having that conversation means you're now articulating things like chaos engineering, things like resilience, things like site reliability. Um, and maybe those conversations haven't been had before. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And, and, and I like the phrase that you used, which is like almost uh, management, like exception based management. And uh, you mentioned stand ups. Um, obviously, you uh, know a, a thing or two about agile. And standups are, are very interesting because, 
you know, as the pandemic happened and people started working, uh, you know, from home and remotely, one of the one of the things that has been, I guess, talked about a lot is this daily stand up meeting, and I feel like it has been attacked a little bit, um, you know, in, in the sense of uh, especially like Zoom fatigue and everything that that comes comes along with it. I, I'm I'm just curious, like maybe tell us more about like what the stand up meeting is and how it should actually be run. Um, so I tend to, so I, I've got a whole bunch of patterns of uh, what I think of as effective software delivery and, and, and delivering things faster and better um, that I've been failing to write a book about for about eight years now. <laughs> and one of them is exactly this. Um, and, and I call it Carpe Diem, right? So Carpe Diem is about, is about your daily stand-up. And so most people think of a stand-up as a, you know, it's a meeting that you have typically early in the day and you're all checking in with each other and saying what you did. And there's a, 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 a formula that seems to have become prevalent of uh, yesterday I, I did this and today I'm doing this and, and whether anything's blocking me. And that to me is the anathema, is the opposite of what a stand-up is. Oh, interesting. So, so let's take it back to first principles. I'm going to take you back to the early 90s. Um, there were, we would, and I, I, I don't know how old you are. <laughs> I was programming in the early 90s. A regular software project might do a release every 18 months, two years. That was cutting edge, right? And, and so you, and every month, maybe you might have a monthly steering. So you might have 18 of these monthly steering things over an 18 month project. And then a number of folks variously around the world. Um, one lady I, I, I'm a huge fan of in Belgium called Martine Devos. Um, she's working in the public sector there. And she said, like, I'm fed up. I'm fed up with these 18 month releases. I'm fed up with working like this. Life's, there's got to be more to life. Team, we are going to ship something in 12 weeks, even if it kills us, right? Or actually, even if I have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's a wonderfully scary lady, Martine. So, and she said to the team, we're not going to fly blind for six, for 12 weeks. We're going to sprint for six weeks, pause, course correct, sprint for another six weeks and then ship. So project this forward to now. That's like delivering once per season. It's not exactly what, but for then it was like completely revolutionary. You're going to do in 12 weeks what we normally do in 18 months. So clearly we can't have monthly steering. That's not going to work. Yeah. So, and even if we have weekly steering for one of these six week sprints, that's like six check-ins, that's not gonna work. So what if we did a daily steering? If we steer every single day, that's like 30 goes in a six week sprint, that's more like it. So really the stand-up is, is a steering meeting. Yeah, it's, a, it's effectively micro planning. It's not a status meeting. Those are very different things. So the way I, so the, the energy I try to bring to a stand-up or the energy that I like that for me that are a healthy stand-up is the team gets together and there's one question. What's the best possible today that we can have? That's it, right? Because we're going to do it all again tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, right now there's six of us or there's eight of us or there's three of us or whoever it is in this stand-up. What's the best possible today we can have? Well, what are the inputs to that? Clearly stuff that's changed since the last time we had that conversation. Um, Aiden built out some new build servers. So the builds are gonna run a bit faster, but you might start getting emails from a different server. Uh, what else? Um, oh, Claire checked in the, 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 all those new automated tests, uh, which means we can be a lot more confident about the email component. You know, so so there's, a, there's a status element to it, but it's not what did you do because I'm your dad. It's what's changed that's cool. What's changed that's going to allow us to have a better day? And then we go, right, team, what's the best possible day? Imagine we have an amazing day. What's it going to look like? We're going to do this. We're going to smash that. This is going to happen. We're going to get these people engaged. Right, and break, right? That's your stand-up. <laughs> you should come out of that stand-up pumped, right? You should be really excited about the day you're going to have. And, and also, this is where, and especially with, you know, what I think of as high-functioning teams, high-psychological safety teams, is Aiden drags his sorry ass in, right? Bags under his eyes and says, team, look, the best possible day I can have is not falling asleep. I had a dreadful night's sleep last night. I've got allergies and we're all like, mate, 
you you do you right you take whatever time you need you know everything's fine is there anything urgent that we can pick up for you so it's also the point in the day where you lean on the team you say do you know what? actually i could really use some support from you folks the best possible day i can have is have my team gather around me and carry me i, I need that day so it's a very human encounter and it's a very focusing as I say, it, it, it's, a, it's a goal setting, it's a steering session, it's not a reporting session, it's certainly not a status and policing session. And you see that yesterday I did this and today I'm doing that. I don't care, honestly, like, you know, with due respect, I don't care what you did yesterday, I trust you. You're a grown up, you're clearly good at this. <laughs> I don't need you to tell me what you did yesterday. I need you to tell me what's the best possible day you can have and how I can help you have that day. That's amazing. I mean, so many insights there. You know, it's it, it's a steering meeting. It's not a status meeting. There's a human elements of it, like, and also just the the question of how can we have the best version of today. So, how does this then relate to manage? So, what is the role of a manager during that meeting? Well, brilliant question. So again, right, your the the the, the manager role is about the environment. Is about the system of work. Yeah. So as a manager in that context, you're maybe like in a kind of coaching type manager role. You're saying, okay, let me look at the faces. Obviously, you've got nine faces staring at you on Zoom or whatever. Let me just gauge the energy here. Right? Let me see what's going on. One of my favorite, favorite delivery leads, a chap called Ivan Moore, he used to do a thing. Um, he got a, on, on one project, you know how you do silly things on projects. And on one project, we all had skater names, right? <laughs> <laughs> and his name was T Boy, right? It's like like T Boy, like that. And <laughs> and he was called T Boy because every afternoon at about three o'clock, he would go around with a post-it, and he'd go to everyone's desk and he'd say, "So, uh, Aiden, can I get you a cup of tea?" <laughs> and he'd say, "Oh, do you know what? I I, I love like uh, a um, we've got peppermint tea. Yeah, sure, peppermint tea. Or I'll, I'll have a I'll have a coffee. Yeah, sure. How do you want it?" And he'd go and he'd take the tea order and he'd go around the whole team. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, the tea arrives and he brings the tea around. And like, you know, you're, hey, that's some pretty good care and feeding, right? That's, that, that's a lot of, but that's not what he was doing. What he was doing was checking in on everyone on the team, where they're at. You might feel super intimidated or, you know, neurodiversity, right? You might be, you might find it uncomfortable to stand in front of a bunch of your peers, especially remotely where you can't, you know, there's much harder to read nonverbal cues and talk about stuff. So what, what Ivan does, he comes and kind of, you know, leans over and says, can I get you a cup of tea? He's picking up your mood. He can tell if you're flat. He can tell if you're having a good day and he can check in. And so what would happen is that as well as getting the tea, he's taken the temperature of the team. And what would happen is each morning with our standup, Ivan would lead the standup with about two minutes of status. This has happened, that's happened, that got delayed. We spoke to these people, we're waiting on this. Da, 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 da. And he told it like a narrative and we're done. Right. And that's kind of like clearing your throat. You know, now no one in the team feels like they need to do status because Ivan already did it. Hmm. But you can only do that if you invest in the team, right? If you bother going around every afternoon to take that temperature check, then you can tell if the team's feeling flat, if one or two people are struggling, if a piece of work that should have been done by now is stuck. And so if the, the manager role there is very much about kind of reading between the lines and finding out what's really going on, bringing that to the stand up and saying, hey, folks, um, I think we all need a break. You know, I think we need to stop being so hard on ourselves or sometimes I think we need to up the pace a bit. You know, and, and having that sense of where people are at is such a powerful um, uh, enabler you know, within a team. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So, so it's interesting. So your point of view then is that post these stand-up meetings, like this should actually give the team energy and so they should walk away energized. Oh man, yeah. You know, we used to, so one team I was working on in the early 10s, I don't know how you call these decades. <laughs> <laughs> in the early, in the, the early, yeah, 10s, is is, um, was we would have two stand-ups each day. We were, we were a tiny team. We started off as three, and like at peak, we were like seven. Um, but it was a very small team, super, super high-performing team, uh, building trading software. 
So internal is a proprietary trading house. So in other words, a, a company that trades its own assets. Um, and so we're writing custom software to do trading. And we would have two stand-ups every day. In the morning, we'd have basically a tech stand-up, which was exactly that steering thing. What are we going to do today? Who's done what? What got shipped? You know, all that kind of stuff. And in the middle of the afternoon, we'd have then a, a kind of a product stand-up, if you like, where the head trader who we were working with would join the stand-up. And, and, and the opening question was, what new toys have I got? <laughs> And each day we'd tell him what new toys he had. And we might have sped this thing up or we might have added some um, analytics to that thing or we might have given him a new way to visualize that. And he was like, this is cool. And so we had very, very fine grained tracking of what we were shipping and we'd get immediate feedback on that. You know, and also he would then say as well, you know, the toys that you gave me yesterday, this is what we're doing with them and this is what we've learned and can we change them? So there was some kind of product uh, feedback came in there. But we found that we that like the the delivery we had like a delivery stand up that was that was about getting the team aligned for the day and even in a three person team can diverge really quickly right so it was about getting the team aligned and so we all knew what we were all up to and we all kind of like well I can help you with that or I already did something here let me let me show you this um, and then the product side was like you know is is what we're doing mattering you know is it having an impact. And so we found that those two every day, it wasn't too much alignment. It wasn't too much coordination. It was a really nice uh, cadence. Yeah. And so I, I guess this is, a, I mean, this is very interesting and, and it's a very clever way to get everybody aligned. Like what, what toys, what new, new things can I play with today? I, I, I kind of like that. That's pretty cool. And it kind of builds empathy for, I guess, like the person that you're, you're actually building this, uh, this software for. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you about, again, in this, you know, hybrid and remote world that's happening, you know, for a lot of people are starting to say like that the first thing that needs to all of a sudden turn into an asynchronous meeting uh, where people just update, you know, a document or, you know, use a stand up bot or something like that. Uh, you know, the first thing that should go asynchronous is, is you know, status or stand up meetings. But I get the sense that if that were to happen, like how does, you know, a stand-up bot is, it's going to be really hard for that to also energize you at the same time. What are your views on that? Should it be an asynchronous meeting, a synchronous meeting? Should anything change? Well, so, so I think you answered your own question. You said you said a status or a stand-up meeting. And as I said, they're very different things, right? So, um, so uh, status absolutely should be asynchronous. Having said that, it's nice to have news it's nice to have a news feed like you know ivan opening the the stand-up kind of thing so i'm a huge fan of human beings synchronizing in real time but not in order to tell each other what they did because that's kind of again with due respect it's kind of dull right i know what you did you you've been working on that css for weeks you did more css i get it right i know what you did <laughs> it's really important it's not exciting to hear really right <laughs> You know, that's not what you have a meeting about. So instead, yeah, automate that. So automate, so, so you're updating um, progress on a story or a feature or whatever, however you track work with maybe comments or updates or something. And you post them whenever they occur to you, whenever you get something done. You know, uh, when there's a release, you should have an automated thing about the release. So automate that. Update those things asynchronously. Um, what I like to get is some kind of digest. So maybe a daily thing in my inbox saying, here's all the things that happened yesterday at random times. So I can just get a sense of how our, our world's moving. One guy I work with um, who's a really, who's, who's really um, again, unusual thinker. He thought about things slightly differently. What he used to do was he had a thing on his screen that whenever anyone did a git push, like did a, a commit, um, the commit message would pop up on his screen. And he wasn't doing it to police people. Again, what he was doing is unconsciously looking for patterns. So if he noticed that maybe two or three people were kind of working in a similar sort of area, he might say, hey, do you folks know that you're working on really similar things? Oh, that's super handy. What are you doing? Well, I'm updating the, you know, the, 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 um, the Excel export. I'm updating the, the CSV file. Oh, right, because I'm, uh, I'm doing some stuff with, with how that data is even formatted. So. If I'm changing the data and you're changing the layout, we should probably be coordinating, right? And, and so, so some of those things, or 
if two people were doing basically the same thing, you know, get them together. So having some kind of digest that brings all this stuff together and says, hey, you know, Aiden, this is what's happened in the last 24 hours is a useful thing. Automate that, have it in my inbox, right? I can ignore it if I like. Um, the, the human element of syncing and wishing each other a good day, <laughs> do that, do that in real time. If you're in a um, distributed by time zone team, much more than you know, distributed uh, geographically, that can be hard. There was one uh, back in the day in ThoughtWorks, this is mid 2000s, they had a huge project working across about 100 engineers in, let me get this right, five offices, uh, four time zones, three continents. <laughs> And it was a follow the sun development model, you know, 24 hour coding. And what they would do is they had a distributed stand up with UK and the US in the UK afternoon. In the US afternoon, they'd have a distributed stand up US and India to hand over to India. In the Indian afternoon, they'd have a handover to the UK. And so you had this distributed double handover each, each time. And there were various rules like don't, don't go home on a broken build. If you go home on a broken build, you stuffed up the next two time zones, right? <laughs> And so if you break the build, the next, the next country round will revert your check-in, right? You will lose your stuff. So, and so people became much more respectful of like keeping the build green. But, um, but no, even when you're, when you're temporarily distributed, uh, absolutely find time to check in with each other. And again, it's, it's, it's what's the best possible day we can have. Yeah, right? I, and, I love and that Once question. you get that mindset, you know, that carpe diem mindset, and it's uh, it, it, it's it's obvious which parts of the stand up should be synchronous and which parts you can just get rid of. Yeah, no, I I, I love that, and and I think you know there's a couple of uh, you know talking about patterns and and kind of establishing patterns. You know, we we started talking about how uh, you know a lot of this is about being a steering meeting. We also talked about how leaders should be really great at um, you know repeating the mission and you know, constantly like repeating what, um, you know, the story of the work that's being done and, and the value. Getting people excited about it, right? Getting people excited. And one of the things that you also talk about when it comes to feedback is this concept of drift. And, uh, and, and you can imagine like the longer feedback or the longer, you know, there's time between you telling a story, uh, the more there can be drift. Um, would love for you to talk about just drift in general and like what teams can do uh, to avoid it. So yeah, so, so <clears throat> drift is about <clears throat> it's more I think to give it some kind of slightly te technical definition, <clears throat> it's about a delay in feedback. When you get a delay in feedback, you create uncertainty, and the one thing that humans hate more than anything else. This is like, you know, core psych 101 stuff is uncertainty, right? We, we would rather be wrong than uncertain. And that's where a lot of religion comes from, for instance. So I say, I'm a Christian. I describe myself as someone I have a very strong faith and I'm largely anti-religion. <laughs> so yeah, religion is all of the stuff that humans bake on top of faith because they like to have structure and because they don't like uncertainty. So in, um, in Buddhism, you have koans, and a koan is a, by definition, it's an unanswerable question. You know, so a koan, like, what's the sound of one hand clapping? You know, can you cross the same river? Um, all these kind of things. And the idea is that um, you wrestle with the question, and, the, and, and it's not whether there's a, like, I can tell you the answer to one hand clapping, and there's no point in me telling you the answer. The, the, the purpose of the question is for you to wrestle with it and learn because it changes you, right? And then in Buddhism, you have this, what they call satori, this moment of enlightenment where you go, oh, oh, right. So, oh, got it. Um, Christianity has the same thing. They're called mysteries. So there are a bunch of things in the Bible that are unknowable. Like what happens when you die? You know, uh, am I going to heaven or whatever, right? It's, it's very clearly written in Christian scripture that the only person who knows that is Jesus. So if anyone else says they do, they're lying. <laughs> they're simply wrong, yeah? Um, <clears throat> there's another one about like the, the Trinity and this split the early church. Like is God, you know, so you've got the, the Father, Son and Spirit 
are they one thing or are they three things? And this split, this was one of the early schisms in the Christian church, apparently. And, and the answer is yes. <laughs> are they one thing or three things? Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and so then when one side or the other says, well, this is right, because we're terrified of that uncertainty. So anyway, bit of a detour. That's what that delay in feedback creates. So how can we reduce that uncertainty? We can shorten the time to feedback. And the way we shorten the time to feedback in work is to do small bunches of work. And this is the idea of batch size in, in lean um, product development is if we work in small batches in small chunks. So the idea of like, you know, multi-month or multi-year feature development in traditional software becoming a multi-week or multi-day or multi-hour software feature development in, in agile software yeah, is all about um, is is all about reducing that time to feedback and it might be feedback from a tool you know did the thing build it might be feedback from automation did the test pass it might be feedback from customers do you like this thing is it useful or feedback from our um, instrumentation are people using this feature and likewise in a kind of human team dynamic if you do something that i think is odd right and i mention it in the moment hey Aiden you just did this thing that I think is odd then it's fresh in your mind it's fresh in my mind it's just recently happened and we can talk about it if I pounce on you and say hey Aiden you did this thing six months ago and I remember it <laughs> and now I want to drag it up <clears throat> what immediately happens to you is this a you, you're going to try to remember it okay I remembered it too lucky I remember it I'm not just kind of guessing um i you're still clearly upset about this six months later which now makes me reassess every encounter we've had over the last six months where you've clearly been resenting <laughs> this thing. you've been stewing on this thing right that that's a really unsettling place to be as you as the person receiving that feedback and if we get into a culture where we only assess feedback every six months or every year you are not just guaranteed to be on the back foot when you receive that feedback, it's there is no possible good outcome, right? So <clears throat> there's a model in feedback called SBI, Situation Behavior Impact, and it's <clears throat> actually came out of um, school, actually came out of schools, and because it works with children, and the idea is that you say, okay, situation, concrete situation, this thing happened, okay? It was on Thursday when we had that meeting with Sarah about the thing. So you remember, I've, I've anchored it now in time and space, right? A behavior, you did this thing. That's objective. That's like an unequivocal. You know, you spoke across Sarah or you shouted or, you know, I thought you were going to speak up about this thing and you didn't say anything and, and that surprised me. That's behavior. That's, that's objective. And then I is impact, how I felt about it, which is necessarily subjective. That made me sad. That made me cross. That made me surprised, right? And so now you get to respond to that. You're, you can't, you're not responsible for how, for my feelings, that's on me, but your behavior had an impact on me that you clearly weren't aware of or may not have been, been aware of, and now you are. That's now something you can, we can work on. And I had a real example of this. I had, well, I was working with a couple of folks um, who one was the other's boss and they were distributed. One was in London and one was in, in the States, in Chicago. And they, their relationship had basically broken down, right? And, and I said to them, right, I work with both of you. You're both lovely and you're both really good at this. So something's wrong. So write down, you know, SBI, write down some situations where you feel you've miscommunicated. What did the other person do? How did you feel? And they both did this and they had one of them made a spreadsheet. Right? <laughs> so he's got this whole list. And anyway, and then they got together with their lists. And they both went, oh, my goodness, I had no idea. I had no idea that's what he was going through your head. I'm so sorry. Right, we can fix this, like, now. And, <laughs> and like, the following day, their relationship was completely different because neither of them had, had the tools to articulate to the other how they were being impacted. So SBI is a fantastic tool for very immediate-term, near-term feedback. So work in small chunks. 
give feedback in small chunks, process things in small chunks is going to minimize that uncertainty and minimize that need to kind of fill it with stuff that we make up. Yeah, no, that that's incredible and and a great model uh, as well, Daniel. This has been super super insightful. So many so many interesting takeaways, and and we, it's been a very wide ranging com- uh, conversation. We even had a chance to talk about religion a little bit, which normally oh, wow. doesn't happen on <laughs> uh, on the show. But this has been awesome. So I guess what you know the the question that we leave um, all of our guests with as kind of like the parting question is for all the managers and leaders out there looking to constantly improve at their craft, uh, what tips, tricks, resources, or just final words of wisdom would you leave them with? Uh, I I tend to refer to other people's wisdom because it's usually a lot lot more reliable than mine. Um, One of the things that I've been really, really um, touched by, impacted by in the last couple of years is i'm sure you hear this a lot is psychological safety um i didn't know i didn't know about it so i'd heard the phrase a lot and the phrase it's one of those phrases where you hear it and you kind of think you know what it means because the words are familiar words you don't you don't know what it means right until you read the stuff (laughs) you don't know what it means it's um so professor amy edmondson from uh harvard business school She is just phenomenal. So she's got a bunch of TED Talks. Um, She's written a a wonderful, wonderful book called The Fearless Organization that talks about um, psychological safety. It's wonderful because it's got lots of positive stories, places where it worked, and lots of negative (laughs) stories of places where it didn't work. And when you're reading the negative stories, you're recognizing scenario after scenario that you have lived, right? And when you read all these positive examples, you're thinking, hey, I could do that. Hey, that's a thing that I could try. Hey, why don't we? And it is so easy to shift a group from low psychological safety to better psychological safety. And one of the key tenets of it is that it's not global, right? So within an organization, you'll have some teams that are psychologically safe and some teams that are less so. So so it's all about sphere of influence. So whoever, wherever you can reach, you can improve psychological safety, okay? Um, It's not about being comfortable or being happy or being any of those things because that's comfort and happiness. Safety is, is, it might be uncomfortable. Safety might be where you feel okay to challenge things. And the core of it is um, there, basically there there are three things that as humans we find really uncomfortable. One is admitting we're stupid, admitting that we don't know. One is asking for help right? Feel like we can't do it on our own. And one is like upsetting the status quo, rocking the boat. And in a business context, right? In a a professional context, these things are like no-nos. Yeah. So asking for, you know, um, admitting you don't know something is incompetence. Yeah. Uh, Asking for help is, you know, is just, you you clearly can't do this. So ignorance, incompetence, and then, you know, and then just being a troublemaker. And so psychological safety is the environment in which all those three things are not just encouraged, but expected, right? I expect you not to be arrogant enough to believe you have all the answers, right? That'd be crazy. I expect you not to try and solve the world on your own because that'd be crazy. I expect you um, to challenge the status quo because of course we don't know the answers. And, And when you create that dynamic, that's psychological safety. And it is unbelievably like until you experience it you're like wow i didn't know a team could feel like this so go read go read and watch everything that amy evanson has done she can do no wrong in my world <laughs> yeah that's that's <laughs> awesome man. Of a human being yeah um, and i uh, haven't yeah, read the book safety is, is, where, is where it's at yeah no that's amazing um and uh i will definitely check out the the type talk and and the book as well uh, Daniel, thanks so much for, for doing this and coming on the show. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure.